Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the very first of the 2018 Human Capital Watches. And uh, today we have an exciting uh, session uh, planned for you. We're going to share a report that will be released tomorrow, so you're going to get a sneak peek uh, at uh, one of our long-standing reports, and it is the uh, C-Suite Challenge for 2018. You may remember in years past, uh, we focused on the CEO Challenge. And you will learn in a little bit um, how much we have expanded this. And we have a, a richer presentation of some findings for you. And so we're very excited to share this with you. So thank you for choosing to join us. You know, as you, as you may know, this, uh, this series that we've been uh, working on for some, uh, for some time now, uh, decades actually, uh, we try to take a look at one of the most pressing issues that CEOs around the world tell us they're focused on. And this year, we've expanded it to also uh, capture the views of CHROs and other C-suite leaders. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time looking not only at what they think, but also how they might see some issues or some challenges or certainly the strategies to address those challenges in a slightly different way. So for those of you who have had a vacation and have forgotten just how these webcasts go, allow me to uh, take just a couple of moments to share things. You can ask questions by uh, putting uh, your question in the chat box, which is in the bottom left of your screen. Uh, we always make the uh, presentations available to you, and you can download those. They're at the bottom center. Uh, you can also make the uh, actual slides bigger, or the video if you'd like. Uh, then you'll see a series of four arrows pointing outward in the upper right-hand um, portion of your screen. And if you click that, it should make the screen larger. And to make it smaller, you would then click it a second time. We take your feedback very seriously, and we would like you to take a very short five-question evaluation at the end. Uh, we, we do review all of the feedback that we get, and we try to uh, improve. And uh, so it's very important to us, and we appreciate it if you would um, if you would help us out in that way. Uh, also, we are recording this, and so within 48 hours, uh, you'll have this available for download. You might want to watch it again, or you might want to suggest some of your colleagues uh, who were unable to attend uh, take a few moments uh, to uh, uh, to watch the, the presentation today. I should remind you that uh, for those of you who are looking to earn uh, continuing education credits, uh, there's an opportunity for you uh, to uh, to do so. You need to type your full name and email address uh, in the space below where it says request credits here. Uh, three times during the program, uh, there will be a an automatic pop-up box. And that is to determine that A, you are still there, B, alive, and not a robot. And so uh, you do need to stay on for the entire webcast. And uh, it's unfortunately only available for live uh, participation only. So uh, that was something that uh, we would encourage you to take advantage of uh, should you be interested in that. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome two colleagues uh, with me uh, there in the studio. That's where I hoped to be before the snowstorm. Uh, but uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to share some of the findings because we've all worked uh, closely on this report. and it's. Uh, creation. And uh, the first is, uh, is Charles Mitchell. Um, Chuck is the executive director of the Knowledge, uh, Content, and Quality. Uh, he's been the lead author on this. He's been the guiding hand on this report for many years. And uh, it's, it's just a real pleasure to see you. And thank you for cutting short your vacation in Jamaica to be with us. <laughs> That's OK, Mom. Thank you. And a belated <laughs> Happy New Year to everyone out there. <laughs> um, and also with us is Michelle Kahn. And Michelle, uh, supports all the work that we do in the knowledge organization. She's the linchpin behind the creation and the execution of all of the uh, content that we do for the betterment of our uh, profession and to help our member companies. And she's been instrumental in the success of this uh, report as well. So thank you, Michelle, for joining. Thanks, Rebecca. Happy to be here. You know, Michelle, uh, this has a long and um, interesting past, this report. And I wondered if you'd may take us through uh, sort of the, the background uh, the methodology and, and some of the reasons why we've we've shifted a little bit uh, in an effort to make this even more robust. Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. So I'd first like to introduce the general theme for this year's report. Uh, for C-Suite Challenge 2018, the theme of our report is Reinventing the Organization for the Digital Age. And uh, here uh, is a display of our co-authors. So Rebecca and Chuck are on the webcast today, and the third co-author is Bart Van Ark who's our chief economist and chief strategy officer. So just a little bit of background on the C-suite challenge. As Rebecca mentioned, this is a long-standing report that we've been doing annually here at the conference board. 
And uh, in its previous version, it was known as the CEO Challenge, which we've been doing for nearly 20 years. Um, we started the survey in 1999, and we've been doing it every year since. Um, but in 2018 this year, we've decided to expand the scope of this project and the survey to include other C-suite executives. Uh, for us, it made sense to uh, expand the scope so that we can gather more data, do more uh, functional comparisons so that we can see how other C-suite executives respond to the survey and rank the different strategies that they would use to address some of their challenges for the upcoming year. And so we were very interested in um, expanding it out to um, the rest of the C-suite, and this includes CFOs, CHROs, CMOs, and the like. Um, and as you see here, we've decided to also keep the general structure of our survey. We organize our survey according to six key challenges. We've got human capital, customer relationships and corporate brand and reputation, operational excellence, regulation and risk, innovation and digitalization, and sustainability. And in addition to these six key challenges, we also ask our respondents to select some of the hot button issues that they expect to face in the upcoming year. And so we'll be discussing that later today in this program. So a little bit more about the survey. We conduct the survey in partnership with 11 organizations around the world. And these are 11 great organizations that are very much like ourselves. They're also membership-based uh, research organizations oftentimes. And they work with us to reach out to their membership to solicit uh, responses to our survey when we failed it in the fall. And so we're very grateful to work with these 11 organizations, and we're very much looking forward to sharing the results this upcoming spring. So here's uh, some information about our CEO respondents by their regional breakout and the revenue uh, of their organizations. Uh, the majority of our responses, uh, the most of them, come from um, Asia. We have 34% of our CEO respondents from Asia. We have about 19% of our CEO respondents from the US, about 13% from Europe, 16% from Latin America, and the rest about 19% from other remaining countries. And here you'll see the revenue breakouts for each region. Um, most of the uh, revenue breakout fall under revenue under $100 million US dollars. Um, but we do have uh, some of our larger companies that uh, fall under $5 million and above, or uh, $1 million to under $5 billion. And here uh, is another look at our demographics. Here we compare the demographics between our CEO respondents and the entire executive C-suite. So for our CEO respondents, we had about 561 respondents. But when we look at the overall C-suite executive uh, respondent population, we had just right over 1,000 respondents. So here, the charts on the left side of the slide here uh, cover a lot of the information from the previous slide. But what you see here is that there is a um, pretty good comparison between um, our CEO respondents and our C suite executives, you'll see that for the regional breakout, it's, it's quite similar. We don't have um, too much discrepancy between our CEO respondents and the C-suite executives. Um, similar to, to revenue, except that for CEOs, you'll see that there's a little bit more representation for those that fall under the less than $100 million uh, category. Here, when we look at the um, industry breakout, um, it's also pretty similar. We've got um, similar distributions for CEOs and C-suite executives. The majority of our respondents come from the service sector, and then we have uh, slightly over a quarter from the manufacturing, and then uh, roughly 15% for um, finance. And then lastly, here, uh, the chart on the lower right-hand side, you'll see the job titles break out. Uh, over half of our respondents are CEOs, um, the next greater portion of our respondent pool comes from um, other C-suite executives. So we've pooled together um, chief marketing, chief sustainability, chief digital, chief technology into that category. We have um, about 11% of our respondents are CFOs, and about 10% are CHROs, and 6% are chief operating operations officers. 
So I'll turn it over to Chuck next to tell us a little bit more about the key insights from this year's report. <clears throat> right. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, indeed, the key insights, when we look at them, there's kind of eight big key findings that, that we found uh, came out of the survey data. And, uh, um, and looking at them, I think the most interesting, uh, obviously, is this notion of recession. There's an optimism, a theme of optimism that spreads throughout the, this year's report in contrast to even the last two years or so. And I think top of that, what really shows that is the notion of recession fading. That was last year's number one, what we call hot button issues. These um, basically tactical issues that CEOs and C-suite executives believe will keep them up at night. And last year in 2017, recession was the number one global issue. It's faded to 19 this year, even in the emerging markets where, uh, where it, was, it was really a, a critical concern with all the uncertainty going on, uh, both in Europe through political issues and in the U.S. with that pending, uh, the pending elections last November. So, uh, but it coinciding with that recession, uh, re the receding of recession fears is, is a growing concern over global trade and global trade systems. Uh, something that we've seen move up the ranks uh, dramatically in the past year. And also the notion of income equality, uh, not only on a national accounts level, but also on a firm level. We see that CHROs um, are looking at income equality within their own firms as a, as a point of tension uh, within their workforces. Uh, and the notion of the political realities in Washington, um, you know, that would be, that's something that we kind of predicted following the outcome of, uh, of the November election. But what we see in the, in the U.S., uh, there's a unique set of concerns among U.S. CEOs. It's centered around health care. It's centered around tax reform. And it's also centered uh, around the notion of trust in, in, uh, in, in government institutions. Uh, the third point is, that, you know, tight labor markets. Globally, we see, we're seeing that uh, uh, labor markets tighten even further. From a, from a relatively tight base, if you will, uh, in the last last couple of years. But this has certainly intensified the talent concerns, not only among the CEOs, but also C-suite uh, C-suite executives as well. And as a result, you're seeing organizations thinking more about uh, the makeup of their future workforces, in particular looking at, at the notion of contingent workers and non-traditional workforces. But we'll get to that in a little more detail a little bit further on into the webcast. Um, the notion of um, CEOs sometimes have a more rosy picture, if you will, of their organizational functions than, uh, than the people on the ground themselves. And in this case, when it comes to nurturing digital talent, um, the CEOs have a perception that their organizations are doing more uh, compared to uh, the view from uh, CFOs and especially CHROs. And to, to further in this notion of reinvention, in a digital era, we look, we, we've asked a, a special question about what uh, what leadership skills uh, that that CEO and C-suite executives uh, see as being essential to, uh, to to digital transform digitally transforming an organization. So we'll get into a little more detail on that. Uh, there's also a notion that um, you know another theme that. The, Besides the optimism about the global economic picture, another theme that we see arise throughout uh, throughout the, the results here is, is, is the importance of culture in organizations. And you know, when, when it comes to the innovation side, culture is really a key priority. But what we what we what we found uh, in a series of special questions about innovation, while uh, the key outcome is top line growth is revenue. Um, there is a real problem in measuring innovation, and not necessarily those outcomes, but the gate stages within an organization, where they are culturally uh, on the innovation side. And then finally, we hear a lot about uh, agility and flexibility uh, as being important in a digital transformation in a digital age. In fact, it's, uh, it's, it's a very high strategy in the operational excellence and risk mitigation categories. But, you know, uh, what we very rarely do you do you do you hear a a definition of what the an agile organization would look like by the people that actually have to execute it in this case CEOs and C-suite and we really do find that so much of it is about change and change leadership uh, I think what surprised us a little too was the important part of that is the notion of big data analytics so those are the the, the kind of the key insights and. And as I mentioned, that you know, with the hot button issues, these are these uh, tactical issues that CEOs uh, and see themselves keeping themselves up up at night. And you know, it's always interesting to look at the uh, at the regional breaks on this, and and they really are a reflection of the microeconomic climate in each of those regions. But you'll see, number one, uh, globally and pretty much across the board, 
uh, is that notion of failure to attract and retain talent. The biggest obstacle to growth that uh, that organizations uh, see in our survey, and th that is critical. Along with that notion of creating new business models, and that's where the digital transformation, the disruption comes in. Uh, it has a ripple effect all the way through the organization, and you'll really see that that that, that notion of business models because of disruptive technology, a key issue in in, uh, in in all parts of all parts of the globe, and kind of closely related to that is a notion of of volatility, cash flow volatility, where uh, changing business models means in, in uncertainty in, in in how you invest in inventory, what the future demand will be for a new business model, and that has CFOs concerned and CEOs is concerned about that notion of, uh, of cash flow. Uh, the next generation leader, very important, uh, obviously. Uh, let's jump down to number eight, where it's that threat to global trade system. Uh, the, that uh, had languished near the bottom of the hot button list for the last few years. And this year, it really made a pretty dramatic jump, uh, 10 spots up into number eight and to make the top 10. And you know, a lot of that is, uh, is really around the, the uncertainty around uh, the future of the European Union, uh, multilateral trade pacts. It, it just feels that uh, that, that notion of, of, of uncertainty that surrounds the future of trade as to whether it's going to be uh, on a country by country uh, bilateral basis or multilateral. And, and that's really uh, become a, a huge concern for, for CEOs and C-suite executives as well. I think when we look at those, those are interesting on the starter, there are some outlier issues. And again, I, you know, this reflects uh, the, the microeconomic climate and, and social climate, I think, to a large extent in each of these regions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the notion of it, it, that unique set of challenges for the, the, the US CEOC, uh, and it is around that erosion or declining trust in political and policy institutions. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a it's a low low to mid level concern globally, but very important no, number eight for for U.S. CEOs. And as I mentioned earlier, the notion of policy around uh, developing policy around healthcare and tax reform, uh, again, a big issue in the in in the U.S. Number nine in CEOs. Um, Brexit, you know, Brexit has has been a kind of a, in our survey a non-starter on a, on the on the uh, across other regions, but it's always a top concern in Britain, and it hasn't faded. In 2017, it was at that same number of rankings, so it's still that uncertainty about how that divorce is going to take place uh, is very much a concern on, on CEOs' minds. And when you look at that notion of of future workforces. Um, that notion of, of Europe's demographics uh, being a concern, or actually, I think, a, a, a great realization of, of uh, this is not a cyclical issue. This is a long-term impact. And, and CEOs, certainly in Europe, get that. Uh, and in China, uh, you know, again, the, uh, you know, all economic distress is local, right? <laughs> not, but you have the economic uncertainty in China is, uh, is certainly important for Chinese, Chinese CEOs. Less of a concern for global CEOs, which is a strong reflection of diversity in trade, uh, in trade, and less resi less relying on on China as as a supplier, if you will, of intermediate goods uh, for manufacturing. Uh, labor relations, both in Latin America and China, uh, very important. And the notion of labor relations, uh, you know, we see in China there's a, 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 a lots increasing amount of reports of of labor unrest. Uh, in, in various factories, but there's also a lot of unreported notions in China, and that situation is probably a little more dire than most people on the outside expect. But there's certainly a recognition uh, among CEOs and C-suite in China that it is a ongoing issue for them. And so, uh, Rebecca, I'll take it over to you to have a look at the, uh, the strategy issues. Well, thanks, Chuck. Uh, just as we uh, leave the hot button issues, I think we've seen over the past few years a steady rise. Um, of failure to attract and retain top talent as well as the uh, development of next generation of leaders uh, fairly high. I think what is interesting here is the rise in disruptive technologies as you pointed out. And later in the broadcast, I know we'll talk a lot about the digital skills um, that are going to be necessary on an organizational basis. And then also some of the top traits for digital leaders. So I, I think that's uh, with very much a very strong theme throughout uh, all of these findings. And the, the bottom line is that many organizations are just woefully unprepared to really address that. So, yeah, yeah we certainly we saw that last year. Uh, with uh, it was less than ten percent of uh, 
of CEOs thought that they uh, that they had the skill levels within their organization, both on the leader and employee level, to carry out a digital transformation. Was shockingly low the number and the confidence and the ability to pull it off. So. Right, and shockingly low how many of them thought that that, uh, that issue, that challenge, was imminently uh, more on their doorstep than, than not. It was sort of like, yes, we know it's coming, but it wasn't a, as hot a, a topic for them. And I think, I think this year we see, we see a heightened awareness of just how important that issue is to address. So. Well, thank you, Chuck. You know, I thought um, you know, I'd shift gears here a little bit and talk about strategies. So as, as was mentioned previously, we, we do two things. We ask about hot button issues, uh, those things that are closer to the, to the uh, near term horizon. And then we also ask about strategies for the perennial challenges that C-suite leaders uh, face. And so what you have here on the slide is the top five um, strategies uh, for uh, each of the challenges, each of the six challenges. And um, while that's a little bit of an eye chart, uh, when you download the life-changing slides, it's, uh, it's going to be much, uh, much easier to read. But I think uh, we're just going to touch on some of the, the big brush uh, strokes here in the time that we have together. So certainly there is a huge emphasis on uh, culture. Uh, culture rules is the section of a, one of the was one of the sections of the reports, but it's very true that uh, C-suite leaders tend to look at their culture as a uh, as a competitive advantage and as a defining challenge uh, for them. This exact same slide, if we advance one here, you can see is um, a, maybe a little clearer to uh, to conceptualize because everywhere you see a green check mark whether that's a strategy related to human capital or sustainability or operational excellence or innovation, those all represent a strategy that talked about the, the, uh, the culture of the organization. So one of the things that was very clear, uh, and you'll see it as the first uh, strategy under the human capital section, was this desire to have a speak up culture. And this does several things. The speak up culture is one in which everyone in the organization feels as though he or she can raise issues or take, uh, take a different view or communicate with all levels in the organization. It's, they're free to do that without fear of reprisal or uh, a career-limiting move. And so uh, many alluded to this uh, in, the, in the surveys as a top choice. I think it also is very important in this uh, day of um, particularly um, stringent uh, uh, headlines where people are talking about cultures and the failure of an organization to really create that culture, which then sometimes um, has the situation where um, behaviors in the workplace occur because the organization has failed to create a culture where people feel they can speak up, where they can uh, take issue with certain things. So if you, if you look at the culture um, sections here, we have also in the human capital area, uh, transparent speak up culture. Uh, and to encourage that as well, communication uh, consistently from all levels. Um, there's a, an outward customer-facing culture that's uh, desired, organizational uh, flexibility, organizational resilience. Um, you can see uh, emphasis on other parts about an engaging culture, uh, also about continual improvement. These are all culture plays, and as we know, leaders have a direct role in shaping the culture because the culture is nothing more than the absence or failure of leadership behaviors to exist uh, in an atmosphere where that culture gets shaped. The other thing I would point out on this slide is that there are a couple of instances where uh, the leadership capabilities were, were relatively strong. Uh, now, there, we, we rank more than the five, obviously, but just in the top five that you're seeing, uh, there was some concern among, uh, you know, this is the CEO slice of the data, uh, around the effectiveness of the senior management team. And in a moment, we'll contrast that with some, the view from the CHRO, uh, but that was important. And I also would just point out uh, one other strategy. It's the fifth one in the innovation challenge. And it's to develop managers and leaders to promote idea sharing in teams. This is where you have leaders who are almost uh, maybe characterized as servant leaders, people who look to bring their team along to uh, capture the wisdom that's inherent in their teams. And we know from other research that we're doing in the employee engagement space, that this one particular category is one of the defining hallmarks of a highly engaging leader. And those are the leaders that every organization wants, because that leader is going to be charged with making sure that his or her team uh, executes, uh, builds together, 
uh, embraces the vision, delivers extraordinary and perhaps discretionary effort. And so this is a very important quality. I just wanted to, to, to carve that out. The other thing on this slide that I would point out is about organizational uh, capability, which is also another theme that runs through this. And you can see that, uh, among CEOs anyway, um, their third uh, strategy was around providing training and development. That we see uh, virtually every time we do this report. And I think that's largely because CEOs see uh, the perpetual upskilling of their, of their uh, respective organizations is a very important um, element of what needs to be done. There's also uh, organizational capacity to increasingly have delivered uh, higher levels of uh, performance. And that's why you see the increased um, interest in having performance management uh, processes and accountability in place. You can also see that um, there are things there in the operational excellence one, the second one down, which talks about an alignment between organizational capability and the strategy and the objectives. And then also in regulation and risk, notice the second strategy is all around improving organizational agility and flexibility. And to Chuck's point earlier, agile organizations uh, have to be built, and they have to be encouraged, and they have to be supported. And that was particularly uh, very important among those who responded to uh, this uh, regulation and risk challenge. If we uh, move to the next slide, uh, I'm going to do the same thing, which is to skip one over. It's the exact same slide. And you can see that in this slice of the data, where we've asked CHROs uh, their impression, when we didn't ask them about all six challenges, but just the ones that you see represented there, uh, many of the same uh, culture plays uh, come into uh, to effect. So notice that they also are looking to communicate effectively, certainly in the human capital uh, challenge. But even higher is the third one there, which is to integrate engagement with business units. They see this culture play of engagement uh, as a very important lever. Notice also that in human capital, the top two strategies for CHROs are leadership uh, development related. So either improving leadership development programs, which is very much reflective of other research that we do, particularly our uh, millennial leadership study from, uh, from, from last year. And then also they're concerned about succession uh, planning for current and uh, future needs. A couple of others that are also leadership related uh, is around uh, holding leaders accountable uh, for behaviors that foster a culture of inclusion. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, as uh, Chuck and Michelle, who were two of the co-authors on a, on a report on in, uh, inclusion and innovation, those companies that tend to be more innovative also tend to be more inclusive. And they have a very specific a desire to put that in place because they understand the relationship between the two. But accountability is where uh, the rubber hits the road with anything. And CHROs are indicating that unless there's accountability, they're not going to have the traction that they desire. And so that level of accountability is, um, uh, is pretty much paramount in their minds. Notice also that you have a strategy that talks about uh, developing managers and leaders to promote idea sharing in their teams, exactly what I talked about a few moments ago. So you can see how the culture uh, is a strong overlay among CHROs uh, throughout this report uh, as well. Now, Chuck, I'm going to uh, take just another moment to compare now the uh, results from, or the rankings rather, from CEOs on the left and CHROs on the right. And this is just with regard to the human capital challenge. So a couple of things I thought were rather, rather interesting to call out. So CEOs, as we know, um, selected as their top uh, strategy to have effective communication from, from all sides, from all directions, among all people. And it, it's a top five selection for CHROs as well. But notice that their second choice, what about the effectiveness of the senior management team, is not of such a great concern to CHROs. I think because there has been in the past a great deal of effort and focus there. And so perhaps they feel that the leadership teams, generally speaking, are in pretty good shape. But do notice the difference. When you get to the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th uh, responses from, uh, from CEOs, it's about leadership, it's about engagement, it's about succession planning, and it's about brand. But notice that those things are much more important, generally speaking, to the CHROs. They're focused on leadership development, employee engagement. And notice also, though, that there's a big disconnect in that very last strategy. So it says the last is the number 10 for CEOs and number 14 for CHROs to increase the efforts to retain top talent. For example, those with 
skills critical to the execution of current and future strategies. Well, if that's the number five high level interest of CEHROs, then why would, um, what, excuse me, if, if the fifth one is about brand and trying to attract and retain talent, why would increasing efforts to retain top talent be so far behind? I would have thought that was higher. So maybe that's a, a missed opportunity or something to take a look at. Because if you're focused on bringing them in, but you're losing them on the back end once they're an employee at the same rate, um, it's just a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So let me stop there. And uh, I'm going to suggest maybe we um, ask people to um, you know, chat, uh, your questions in the chat box, anything you'd like to ask us. Um, but uh, Michelle or Chuck, anything to, to add to anything I've touched on that maybe we should spend a moment on? Sure, yeah. So I think um, you've given us a lot of detail about how important culture is uh, this year for our C-suite um, respondents. You do see that culture plays a big role in the different strategies that they plan to utilize to address some of their key challenges. So looking at the customer relationships and corporate brand and reputation challenge, we also see that, at least for CHROs, cu uh, culture is also one key strategy to address this challenge. Their first strategy is to develop a more outward-looking, customer-centric culture as a way to better address this challenge. Um, but for CEOs, this is uh, their number three strategy. So there's, there's some alignment in that they both consider this to be an important strategy, but there's some discrepancy in how important they rank it. So I think you know I think there's one thing that, that's it's interesting here and that did, that did jump out at me as uh, as when I was reviewing the data overall. But if, when you start to look at some of the CHRO answers uh, towards these uh, these strategies, that there is an emphasis and more so than in any other function on on uh, the use of big data and big mm -hmm. data analytics. Yeah. It shows up in a lot of these these notions. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a, an area that, that sometimes is, is is difficult to get translated into in, into action. But you know, CHROs seem much more aware uh, of the importance of analytics than other functions within their organizations, which we found mm -hmm. we found kind of interesting. And the same kind of goes a little bit for for that notion of, of social media and uh, and mobile applications. But you know, that overall theme that. Um, that it's you know the, the 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 human resources side that is more concerned about big data than the CFOs or CEOs themselves, and I we, we kind of found that as an interesting notion. Yeah, that's true, Chuck. That is really interesting to see here, especially since they rank uh, as number two, their number two strategy here is to employ big data analytics to better understand shifts in customer patterns. So here, their top five strategies relate to better understanding the customer through the use of analytics and big data. And it does, you know, not to say it's not important to CEOs too. It's in right. their top ten, but it just doesn't rank as highly. Right. Um, and also, what's surprising about this slide is that um, the the strategy that's ranked number ten for CEOs and number seven for CHROs improve alignment and accountability of corporate business practices, management behavior with corporate values. It's interesting to see that it's not ranked so highly. Um, this type of strategy, um, I would have thought that at least for CHROs, it would have played a more important role here. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I think part of what we see on this is is when you put together the notions of changing business models, and then the notion of of, of developing um, digital uh, digital products and services, uh, a whole change in in the serviceization, you will, of products. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, you start to you know, you we've seen that shift in the last year, last two years, really. Of uh, that kind of notion, um, replacing the idea of, the, of of not that corporate values or, or, or communicating those corporate values out to uh, to customers has gotten any less, but the focus is really now shifting uh, uh, away from a softer look at that at that, if you will, mm -hmm. to really meeting the customer demand in the digital space, and and uh, that's that, that's one of the changes I think over the last uh, two years that, that that has jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. So we'll go on to the next slide, the innovation. And Rebecca did cover a, a large part of this uh, in, in that top five strategy. But when you start to look at, 
at the comparisons uh, of CHROs and, and CEOs in the innovation space. And, and I, I think one of the things that jumps out uh, on the, H, uh, the human capital side is the notion of inclusion, the importance of inclusion to innovation, as Rebecca had mentioned. I mean, when you look at that notion of, of holding leaders accountable for behaviors, uh, you know, much more uh, on the minds of, of CHROs than CEOs, and and developing managers uh, and leaders to promote that idea sharing. That you know, that's as the research that we have shown in the past that that there is a that there is definitely a link between inclusion uh, and and how inclusive an organization is and how innovative ultimately it will be. So uh, you know, the, those the, the, there's that focus really on. Um, on getting building that culture within the, the CHR notions of of, of strategy and, and just the democratization, you will, of of of, in, of innovation through the organization by that number five ranked on the CHRO. That's invest more in in uh, innovation skills throughout the workforce. Uh, a, a notion that that again that we kind of see uh, we've seen over the last few years this broader definition of talent, if you will, where a lot of the strategies in previous years had been laser focused on leadership and, and the rank and file maybe not so much but now uh, you know I think there's linking back to the notion of agility and flexibility and 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 and, uh, and making sure that that innovation as a culture is spread throughout the organization from the top all the way you know down to the bottom and then innovation comes up not only not top down and it's not it's not assigned to a particular r d lab it's 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 everyone is an innovator in the organization and we're really seeing chrs on that recognition So turning over to the operational excellence challenge and comparing the CEO and CHRO responses, we see that CEOs and CHROs are aligned on the top strategy, which is to improve their organizational agility and flexibility. And this goes back to the earlier message about how important, uh, how important culture is for uh, organizations. Um, and the comment earlier about how important uh, big data analytics is to CHROs, we also see that come into play here with um, the number three ranking for CHROs. They rank uh, number three, the um, improve their use of big data analysis for strategic planning. And so um, it's interesting to see that uh, for CHROs at least compared to other members of the C-suite that big data does play a pretty big role for them in how they think about their, um, how to address their challenges. It certainly does, and I think you know, going back to the notion too of talking about performance management a little bit. Uh, you, you know, when you look at the the human capital ranking for the alignment of compensation and incentives, uh, number five in in the mind of of uh, CHROs. Um, it's interesting on a geographic break when you look at that. That is the actual number one operational excellence strategy in China, uh, and an area where we know uh, where you've seen that disconnect between performance and 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 reward uh, and. Uh, as growth starts to slow a little bit, you get the long, soft fall of the macro economy in China. That notion of linking performance to compensation is very much on the minds of CEOs there. So it's an interesting regional uh, fix. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last thing about some discrepancies that we're seeing here. Um, it's the number two strategy for CHROs, but number eight for CEOs. And this is the strategy to redesign business processes uh, to strengthen digital transformation. So perhaps this is more of a, an inward look where CHROs are seeing that this is an area for improvement, but CEOs don't agree. They see it as less of a priority for them to to address this challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think it really just fits in with the, with the, with what it, how you would define a, a digital transformation, which is mm -hmm. uh, you know not sporadic uh, digitization of specific services or, or uh, functions, but it, it's a it's a holistic view across the enterprise and and. Uh, and seeing that the, the importance of redesigning business processes, uh, you know, the critical part of, of digital transformation across the organization, uh, you know, uh, th and, and CHR is something that they have to deal with and live with on, on a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting those processes, catching it up with the ideas, if you will, is uh, for digital transformation is, I think, is the reason that we see it so high here. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh, so we're going to um, mentioned earlier about the notions of uh, 
of defining agility. You know, there's so much, uh, so much talk about what agility is. Uh, and you know, now we get a notion of, of what the importance and or how, how you get to be an agile organization in the views of people that are living this on a, on a daily basis and the CEO views. Uh, you know, it, and it, so much of it is around effective change leadership. That's uh, you know a, a, a critical a critical aspect that we see uh, across the board from 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 all functions here. Um, interestingly enough, I you know I think that CEO, CEOs when they see that that the importance of of, of uh, a resilient workforce, but on an individual basis, and being able to equip those individuals to 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 to, to take change and handle change. Uh, Inside the in the workplace, uh, seen as much more seen as, as more important in, in the CEO's uh, view than it is still important, but but little less so than you will in the CFO and and, and CHRO uh, space. Uh, and the, you know the importance of a speak up culture, that safe place that able to express ideas that that feeds back into building an inclusive organization. Um, you know, very much uh, an important an important aspect for. Uh, for the CEO and CHRO function, so um, you know, very, very important on that. Um, so uh, Rebecca, then there again too is that notion, right? That jump up of the, on the agility side is uh, the, the use of big data analytics, uh, viewed by the, the, the human capital function as uh, as an essential aspect of, of defining agility and. Uh, you know that all, as you can see, that you know, in order to act and act quickly, you need to know where you're heading, and that's where the big data analytics function really is important. So, Rebecca, is there anything that you see on this that that surprises you, or? Uh, no, I think I think we've already called out the focus on big data. I I think one thing that um, I I would perhaps mention is, and it hasn't maybe been uh, beaten to death is around the, the need or the desire for highly engaged, motivated uh, employees. And when you look at this slide and the, the one that you have on the next slide as well, um, very, very uh, high, uh, just about anywhere you look at this. So uh, I do think that, again, it speaks to that culture play, whether that's accountability, innovation, engagement, or you know flexibility, resiliency. It's uh, very much a focus on how will we get our people prepared to meet the challenges that are on our doorstep or just around, just around the corner. Yeah. So the next side, I mean, it's sometimes agility is defined by where you sit physically, and in this case, you know, I think we see some interesting contrast. And I, the data is always an interesting contrast between the U.S. I think and, and China. Uh, not only worldview, firm view, business view, um, always, always contrast and difference in emphasis and. And and which kind of plays sometimes the state of of, of, of that particular emerging market, but uh, you know in this case that uh, you know there's still uh, an, an importance of uh, of change leadership. Uh, you know we see in the U.S., China, and and in particular in, in Europe where it's ranked number one. So uh, that you know is, is across the board is a realization that agility is is about change change management. But when you look about that resilience of individual employees. Um, you know, less so uh, in, in the China space, and again, that could be very much part of um, uh, of the overall culture, national cultures, uh, national cultures there, um, where it's uh, it, it's seen as less of an issue uh, in in uh, in China. But you know, when you look back down at, at the number one rank in China, in particular, that again, that you know, big data analytics. Um, and more so, you know, more important than in, in than in the U.S. or Europe. And uh, you know, that's another theme I think that that we we have seen throughout uh, this report and in the last two years even that um, there seems to be in Asia Pacific, but in particular China, much greater focus uh, on that use of, of of big data analytics. They seem to have uh, made that, if you will, a great leap forward in the in, in the realization that analytics is really going to drive their business. And that notion of a whole digital transformation and emphasis on developing service industries in China and, and the importance of big data analytics. And in some ways, we always felt that maybe the Chinese CEOs were ahead of uh, their counterparts in the West when it came to that recognition. Um, and it's still, to some point, um, very much the case. Uh, and you know that that notion of, of, of flattening organizations. Um, 
you know, important in Europe, important in China, um, where th there is, is more of a staid, if you will, uh, corporate culture where the hierarchy, the power distance notion is, is, is still very important. So, um, you know, they're looking to flatten those organizations. I think the reflection of the relatively lower ranking in the U.S. is that that's, there's, that's been an effort that has, has been underway for some time. And, uh, and we're starting, you know, that's starting to pay dividends where I think in the other parts of, uh, of our survey universe that uh, people are still catching up a little bit on that. Uh, you know, very much, very much so. And then, you know, in the U.S., the, the number seven ranking, that elimination of functional silos is really kind of a first step. But, but you know, it, it's, uh, that's about building an inclusive organization and an agile organization is getting it de-siloed. So, you know, we see that, uh, we see that very much so in, on, on the data. So, and, and we had talked earlier about uh, the whole notion of, uh, of redefining the future workforces. And, and when you look at the, the CHRO response to um, way that way they think they're going to be. I mean, first of all, we see that whole notion that 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 pretty much across the board universally that there is a, a anticipation of great change within the, the makeup of uh, of the of uh, the corporate workforces. Uh, and this is you know this question was asked in a context of a three to five year span. So uh, it's it's a, it's a little bit you know medium term. Uh, but you see that that notion that there's going to be you know greater use of contingent workers. There'll be certainly a greater use of digital labor. You know the robotic process automation. Uh, the, the, all of that will will increase uh, as uh, and and being driven to to a large extent or by the tighter labor markets globally. Uh, you know we we were doing some work on the economic side that really looks at. Um, uh, the reshoring notion for manufacturing and intermediate goods, and we've seen a you know, significant movement in the last couple of years uh, that that is actually taking place, and a lot of that would have to do with uh, wage inflation in a lot of the emerging markets, China in particular, but also that notion that you can reshore this material into, um, uh, reshore that back in, uh, to, your, to your home country because of the help of uh, digital, trans, uh, digital technologies and automation. So uh, that, it's, kind of turned, it's kind of turned that whole notion on the supply chain on its head. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, it, with that notion. And of course, you know, contingent workforce, it's pretty hard to be an agile organization without that notion of, uh, of the future of work, the Hollywood effect, if you will, or the gig economy, the, the project. Uh, work built around projects, and and there's I think in the, all these charts a recognition uh, that that's going to be uh, much more important for an organization down the road. Um, but you know, with that, um, you know, if that's a solution to a tight labor market, uh, contingent workforces, uh, it brings its own unique set of challenges or issues with it. And th this chart shows that uh, you know. What are the concerns about hiring contingent and non-traditional workforces? And you know, the number one issue is finding the skills. So you know, what it comes down to really is a shortage. Is a shortage. Is a shortage. If the skills aren't there, that's you're not going to find them in-house, and it's going to be a struggle to find them also out on the open market. So there's a clear recognition and alignment between the CEO and CHRO on that for sure. But I think you know what what starts what 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 is becoming what is interesting in, in, is that notion of the engagement and retention, uh, and not only of the contingent workforce or the non-traditional employee, but again high on their list is that it's the engagement and retention of the traditional full-time employees. So you get this natural tension, this friction uh, between the, the the two sets of workforces, if you will, and you'd hate to call them two sets because it all should be one. But that, 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 and that's that's seen as a, as an issue on uh, in, in the minds of of, of CEOs and C-suite and CHROs, uh, you know, and some of those issues that that would hurt the productivity of the workforce. The the notion of of uh, concern about the, the proprietary uh, information and knowledge walking out the door, uh, a challenge to manage that at any level. Uh, and managing the customer face, facing interactions very much a concern of CEOs when it comes to contingent workforces. Uh, you know that that notion of the cult, customer centric culture, but you know are the contingent non traditional workforces the contract folks going to get it have it in their heart 
as uh, as deeply as the full time employees, and that's a concern for for CEOs. Chuck, um, if I could offer a, a, a thought on this, I know we've talked about this in the past, but I was surprised that the concern around engagement levels was as high. And I was also surprised that the engagement level concern was focused slightly higher on the non-traditional employees. I, I understand you know, the, the constraints that many companies have in terms of how employees are treated. And certainly, no one is going to advocate that they shouldn't be treated with respect or have a safe culture and a safe workplace. But in terms of assessing engagement, many organizations don't currently tap uh, the non-traditional employees for their views around employee engagement. And there are a variety of legal reasons why they are uh, somewhat different in the workplace, whether that's uh, the badge or what they're included to or the amount of training or exposure they have to things. But I, I think what's important here to, 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 call, to call out is about the legal issues. You know, the, the, the law tends to follow the uh, incidents in the workplace or the, the waves of behavior or change that happen in the workplace. And I'm hopeful that there will be a, a rapid closing of the gap so that companies can feel more comfortable about tapping these non-traditional workers and building a cohesive and, to your point, all one sort of culture uh, where all can thrive. Uh, no matter what someone chooses to have their uh, work behaviors or their working arrangements look like. So my hope is that we'll start to close the gap on that, um, on some of the legal support for choices that companies will need to make in this area. I think that's a, that's a really good, that, that's a good point. And I, you know, I think that notion of, I mean, we'll certainly see that play out um, across the globe, that whole notion of, of, of the whole legal and, and labor law issues. Uh, uh, you, you know, in a digitally transformed uh, uh, society, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a real issue that uh, it's going to take time to resolve. But it's uh, it, it, it's it's a potentially one of the flies in the ointment, if you will, uh, as as a uh, as a risk mitigation or as a, as a problem solving strategy for for labor shortages. So it'll be no interesting question. to see how that plays out. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, just to, 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 to again look at the, the notion of, of uh, the contrast in, 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 uh, in innovation strategies, uh, there's an emphasis again on the CHR side very much about the inclus inclusive, inclusive strategies uh, about sharing in teams and, and, um, and behave, holding leaders uh, accountable for those, those cultures that, that, that drive inclusion uh, and, and innovation. Um, you know, there's... Uh, that again, that notion of of, uh, of more diversity and inclusion on innovation teams slightly higher in the minds of CHROs than uh, than it is in CEOs. And again, it's a reflection of some of the work that we've done that looked at the inclusion and innovation relationship, uh, where you know certainly the diversity side of, of um, having diverse teams uh, is important. But you know, diversity in that case could be an empty suit if the leader of that team is not. Uh, inclusive and is not making sure that individuals on that team are being heard and those ideas being heard. So, you know, again, it's a very much an, a focus on the on the idea of uh, of, of include the importance of inclusion that CHROs see uh, in the innovation sphere. And so now, uh, you know, we're at the um, at the notion of. Asking, asking that question as to what you know, what do you see? What are the critical notions uh, of the importance, leadership, future leadership traits or characteristics uh, that uh, that will take a, an organization through um, through digital transformation um, to be an effective leader uh, in a digital uh, in a digital world? And and uh, you know, I think there's some interesting contrasts on the regional side. Again, you know, maybe those those skills uh, are. The importance of those skills uh, are measured by where you sit to some extent on the geography side. Uh, but you know, the notion of, 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 of being a strategic thinker, important globally, uh, important here in the US, and the notion of adaptability, uh, again, you know, uh, very critical. Uh, entrepreneurial, um, you know, that creating ways to find value out of digital transformation, the notion of new business, uh, new business models. Uh, number one in Europe. Um, so, uh, it, you know, an issue there again that um, in, in, a, in, a, in a region where regulation can sometimes uh, stifle or slow down innovation, uh, it 
falling back now to business individual business leaders or individual organizations to foster that entrepreneurial spirit, which can be sometimes contrary to that high, highly legislated area. So in, your, in the minds of European CEOs, that is, uh, that's the most critical uh, trait for, for their future uh, leaders. That, that notion of, of you know being entrepreneurial also important in Asia too, um, and you know I think you see, again you see that in sometimes of the, the the notion of uh, the power structure and the hierarchy within uh, within firms in that in that region. So uh, you know there the, the, I always it, it, I, the notion of being technically savvy uh, bottom of uh, bottom of the list, and you know nowadays that that's just key money. I mean the assumption is that I think it was all about building digital their technology skills a few years ago, that's the key money. Now that the assumption is that, the, that your future leaders will certainly have that, have that in spades and, uh, and it's, it's not something that, that they're looking for because the assumption is there that, uh, that everybody's got it. So. so um, move on, we can move on to uh, so I think that, that wraps up uh, what we have to say about some of our findings in this year. Without question, and thank you, Michelle and, and Chuck, for, for joining uh, to, to, to walk us through. I, I just want to leave the, uh, the group with a, a couple of closing thoughts. And that is uh, certainly, you know, this is part of our ongoing series of research in human capital. And I'm hopeful that you'll download the slides and that you'll go online and uh, uh, retrieve your copy of the report when it uh, is posted tomorrow. Um, we have a, a continual stream of things that we think you'll find interesting. Our next one up is the Global Leadership Forecast. That's our joint project with EY and DDI. And it is the world's largest uh, leadership development study. I've had the privilege to partner with an entire team uh, to put that together. And we're going to bring you the highlights uh, next month on the Human Capital Watch. You know, it's the responses of 25,000 leaders and 2,500 CHROs. And I think you'll find, um, again, you'll be a lot around digital transformation, a lot around uh, organizational agility and the leaders that are going to be necessary uh, to be successful. So I hope you'll, you'll plan to, to join us for that. Um, I should also mention, too, that we have a variety of uh, publications that you may find interesting. And I, I hope you'll check back often or attend more of these webcasts so that you have an opportunity to hear the highlights, uh, if not to memorize the reports themselves. Uh, we are looking for feedback, as I mentioned, uh, and I hope you'll take just a few moments. It'll come right up after the, uh, the webcast today. If you have suggestions for topics, if you have a great story to tell, uh, you know, I have the privilege of leading the human capital practice as well as the human capital research area, so please do reach out and let me know. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts and particularly your suggestions for uh, some of the areas where we need to uh, really be thoughtful. So uh, finally, I will leave you with uh, just... Uh, the opportunity to uh, continue to take this journey with us. Uh, I want to thank you for choosing to be here uh, and to attend. And I was, want to especially thank uh, Michelle and Chuck uh, for their hard work on this report and the opportunity to share this with our member companies. So we'll say goodbye. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today. <laughs>